Hello, world singers. My name is Brooke. And I'm Tyler. And this is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. Conversations. Words of Radiance, part two. We back. We doing it. This is the reread for everyone. We have just finished Words of Radiance and are on our merry way into Oathbringer, but there is a bunch to talk about in the Holy second moly. half of this book. There is a reason that we <laughs> split these books into two parts, and I'm so glad that we did because just part four and five. Like, there are so many things to talk about. I couldn't even fit them all in our episode notes. I tried very hard. and For hours. I, like, squeezed them in where I could, but. (laughs) By this time, you all know, hashtag all spoilers all the time. We are covering everything after part three in Words of Radiance. The epigraphs, the interludes, parts four and five, the epilogue, and we'll make all the different connections in this episode get on a whole bunch of stuff that's happening in the cosmere right now there are games oh my gosh stormlight archive games there is the kickstarter for way of kings wow just big shout out to the cosmere fandom biggest kickstarter publishing campaign ever just exceeded the goal by astonishing amounts within an hour so way to go nerds out there yeah i think there's always like this question of is fantasy relevant are fiction stories relevant how are they relevant how is their relevance today different than how it was in the past and i think in particular for adults yes right clearly, yeah. like and that is something reflected in this kickstarter because adults are the people with the money to donate to things like this in large part yeah i mean unless you resell in supreme uh which is a thing that kids do now so they tell me <laughs> i think that uh what is great about words of radiance we talked about this last episode it's a little bit of a filler in between book just because it's a sequel but it's also setting up so much that has to happen in the future but the way that brandon organizes his mind and his writing in this very clear kind of five-part structure with the interludes woven in between i think it's really significant and important to have that structure when you're dealing with a story that is so large so complicated and has so many different aspects sometimes happening on different worlds or just across the entire world absolutely and to that point i think something i didn't put this down for my can't wait but it's kind of my can't wait you can't wait so go for it (laughs) a big thing that stood out to me about this book is that yes it is a middle book But it's also only book two of a 10-part series. And I think as only book two, there are so many things here that are going to come into play later. Like, there are so many significant things that are already happening in only book two. Whereas I feel like a lot of series, particularly series this long... Once you get to, you know, the last couple of books, you look back and you're like, wow, book one and two, like nothing was happening in those books that would have, you know, made me think we would be here today. And I think that in this case, we're going to look back and be like, oh, my God, we got seeds of that in book one. And now it's finally like coming to fruition. And the satisfaction, I think, is going to be very high. (laughs) I believe we talked about this last episode as well. The overall Cosmere and specifically the Stormlight Archive kind of narrative arc, I feel, is going to really mimic an individual book arc that Brandon has where he is telling amazing stories and having amazing setup in the parts one through three and then the conclusion which at this point would be like books seven through ten in the stormlight archive um is just going to be all crazy sander savalanche oh my god (laughs) and i love it i'm super excited for it uh that's the the payoff for all of this because you're totally right 
hit me with some of the things that you can't wait to talk about. I know they're there. These little tidbits in the book that you think you're going to come back or already have an Oathbringer come back that we see more of. Yeah, these are little things that jumped out to me that I think are really significant. They're not necessarily big enough for, you know, a separate talking point each on their own, but just some things to throw out that we're going to keep sort of keeping our eye on as we continue reading. Um how the shattered planes were shattered. Shalon says in this book that it was not a natural occurrence. She like intuits that, knows that from the way that she can see the shattered planes in her mind. And she connects it to cymatics, which we are introduced to in book number one. So yeah. real cool there. I definitely think this has something to do with the greater mythology on the Cosmere, or on Rashar rather, and and the history of the planet. And then also when they are in the chasms, during the uh, storm that comes, the high storm, Kaladin sees these big, like, alien-looking light figure storm walkers, which I believe we also see in Oathbringer. So we'll come back to that because I feel like we talked about that in our Oathbringer podcast. But, like, what the heck are those? Those haven't been explored at all. That's got to be coming up somewhere. Do you think there may be, like, a, a similar storm version of the stone monsters that we do see in Oathbringer? Maybe. Could like, be. I have no idea. There's literally just a fragment of a sentence about them, and yeah. that's it. But it was important enough to mention um, the Rishadium, like where do they come from? In this book, we finally get sort of a just tiny little glimpse into what the Rishadium are, what their relationship with their writers are. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on. We suspect that they are going to have something integral to do with the foundations of Rashar being a music rhythm centered planet. Yeah, I think that the Rishadium really are the key that everyone in the future will look back on and be like, oh, this was clearly always here. You mentioned that uh, cymatics was also always part of the book and the music hints um, have just been present. But it is in Oathbringer, I think for the very first time, that Adolin remarks that in world, the Rishadium are sometimes called the third shard, blade, plate, and Rishadium. And you had mentioned off mic that maybe they were the original shard. And I just think the Rishadium are a key to unlocking a lot of the mysteries Definitely. on Rishard. Like when you fully understand the Rishadium, you will understand a lot more about Rishar. <laughs> yeah. And so very excited uh, for those and the continued role they have to play. My Yeah, and I think, and then that brings me to another one of my little things here, which is the relationship that we're starting to see between the Parshendi and, like, the Great Shells with their gem hearts, which may also, you know, connect to the Rishadium, and then humans being able to bond Spren and, like, the relationship between Spren and gems and Fabrials then, and just all of those, like, sort of different versions of something similar that is happening on this planet we start to see in this book. Along with animals, we also get a very small mention uh, from Adolin. He sees a quote unquote like fantastical or fictional um, image of an animal that looks or is described very much like a lion, which makes me wonder if there were once warm blooded mammals on Rashar and like what happened to them. Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing they met a similar fate to many of the large warm blooded mammals on Earth, which is they got hunted by humans. Maybe. But, uh, I also or think like, were they destroyed when the storms first yeah, came? Yeah, a climate change like event, yeah. like wiped out all of the animals of that type that maybe used to be able to live in a more cultivation friendly. Uh, or Rashar. like, did they come with the humans from Ashen? Who knows? Anyway, I'm just throwing these Wild little, little things out there. And then lastly, a small mention uh, from Teravangian that Gavilar uh, confided in him his 
visions that he was having on the night of the feast when Gavilar died. And so I'm wondering, maybe, I think this is likely, we will get a prologue of the feast from Teravangian's perspective. With the role that Teravangian comes to play in Oathbringer and kind of how he is clearly almost like Odium's partner or champion in some way, I think that that's a good bet that we will get to see a lot more Teravangian as our first person uh, narrator in a lot of these coming chapters or interludes. And I just thought that was so interesting because it kind of interweaves Teravangian into like the Dalinar side of the story a little bit. You know, like Dalinar has gone on this whole sort of quest because of Gavilar and Gavilar confided in Teravangian, like trusted him in, you know, some sense. And then Teravangian took that information and like went on his own little quest. Seems like a very Teravangian thing to do. He's not not a big team player. (laughs) What about you? What is your thing that you can't wait to talk about? Well, everything. Everything is wonderful. Yeah. (laughs) But I think the ending of Words of Radiance really just packed a dozen different type of punches that is 100 percent how i feel as well there were just moment after moment after moment that i was just like oh my gosh i'm dying for me the biggest one and probably the most important one since our podcast name is cosmere conversations the most important thing to the cosmere is a cheerful voice that pops up in the head of zeth that says hello would you like to destroy some evil today that moment is so epic like that is just mic drop walk away book over like blow your mind nightblood arrives on rashar (laughs) gifted from a herald to zeth who had just been resurrected by a fabriel that henceforth had been unknown yeah this is i have this in my five favorite moments talk talk about some more stuff but i think this is if not the most important Cosmere moment so far, then it is certainly in the top five. It's the biggest moment when the worlds are united. Yeah. And we're like, literally take as a, a main... fan. Yeah. It's like, okay, now we're, now we're in it. Yes. Now we're in the real thing. And I think this is actually important as, so this is, this book was published in 2012. Oh my the god, was first, it that long ago? Yeah, the first Way of Kings was 2010 because we're coming up on the Leatherbound yeah, edition, yeah, yeah. so 10 year anniversary there. And I think that by 2012, if you look at the books that Brandon produces afterwards, which is like all of the Mistborn Era 2s uh, and Oathbringer, obviously, but several of the other short stories and novellas, it is just the next stage when you compare it to the first kind of era of Brandon Sanderson's writing, which is Elantris, Mistborn, there's just a clear delineation. And there are lots of ways we could talk about this, but basically Brandon has come into his own. He's not pulling any punches. Yeah. He knows exactly how he wants to spice the soup and he's not holding back. And he's the chef. Like he's the head chef now. I think One of the things that we talked about really loving about the Cosmere in the first place is that it was this hidden epic that he had to create as a young writer because you're not allowed to sell to like a publishing house a large epic that's like, oh, this will be 40 books. Just please buy this first one. (laughs) Don't Uh, worry. People will like it. I promise. Yeah. (laughs) They're like, oh, I can't really take your word for that. So he wrote 10 books and subtly interwove them. And by the time he gets to Words of Radiance, that mentality is gone. Like, that's a childlike state of I don't of think brain. that's necessarily true, because he will still say when asked that he wants the series to be able to be read standalone. That if you don't want to invest in the greater Cosmere, he wants you to be able to just invest in Mistborn or just invest in the Stormlight Archive. Clearly, and I think we cannot do that. We, we, oh, <laughs> we are well beyond that point. <laughs> But this is important because I think that it is with Nightblood arriving on Rashar. We already had Zahel uh, slash Vasher. And I think that 
there was this question of like, well, he's a real side character. He's not directly involved in a lot of the action. Which is how everything has been yeah. up until this point. It's all been like super, super subtle where if you get it, cool, you get it. But if you don't, you won't even notice yes. really. So like Zahel Vasher is what we saw in the early period of Brandon's work. And Nightblood slash Azure in Oathbringer, like that is just directly involving a main think, character from Warbreaker yeah. in the Stormlight Archive. Azure in particular, I think, is stands out even more than Nightblood. I think if I hadn't read um Warbreaker. Warbreaker and I read this, it would still be interesting and like not alienating where i would still be like "Ooh, what is this sword like what's going on with this sword there's Mm -hmm. something weird happening here that i would still like really be interested and invested whereas azure i feel like more so sticks out like a sore thumb where it's very obvious that there's something weird happening with her but if you haven't read warbreaker you don't really even have the way in to start solving that mystery whereas if you have it's a little bit more like exciting to be able to have those tools in your brain to think oh okay who is she who do i think she is which i love and we have those tools clearly at this point we're not a podcast nor are we readers who are without all of that other (laughs) knowledge we're all spoilers all the time and i believe that this is why this is like one of the reasons that brandon gets to a point in his own professional development when he's like I can do what I want. Yeah. I have this plan. I'm going to try to execute this plan. And he is in no way by 2012 being held back by any type of limitation. If he wants to put Nightblood at the end of Words of Radiance, guess what? He can. And no publishing company is going to be like, you know what? You're not popular enough at this point to do that. Yeah. You just smashed the Kickstarter record with one of your (laughs) books, but you can't do what you want to. I think we're going to see more... In that vein going forward, though, like more more commitment, yes, I guess, yeah. because in Sanderson's most recent state of the Sanderson, um, he, I think for, for the first time that I've seen anyway, acknowledges like, I have a lot of writing to do and I'm kind of getting old. Yeah. And he expresses a a desire to be really dedicated and really streamlined with what he's writing going forward because he really wants to be able to finish. And I think that's going to contribute to his sort of don't give a fuck attitude of like, I'm, I need to tell the story that I want to tell now because I may not have enough time to write extra books to add in the things that I want to do. Not to be a downer. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, Finish all of the work, Brandon. Like, we are counting on you. Otherwise, this is going to be just a podcast without an end. Oh, my God. (laughs) Keep going forever. No, I I can't do that. We're not going to do that. We're just going to keep it all positive. Brandon's going to finish. Definitely. And we are going to, well, let's go rough cuts. Okay. Is there anything at all that you did not like about the second half of Words of Radiance? My note says literally nothing. Except maybe how many times my heart breaks. I also didn't like all the times I had to cry. Oh, my God. I mean. So much crying. There is a moment where Adolin's horse, Sureblood, dies in the final battle. And I had to, like, put the book down and stop and just be like, okay, now I'm going to have to process these emotions. It's so tragic. It is. It's absolutely tragic. And it's such a quick moment yeah that, it's a very war like thing yeah it's literally right at the beginning they're like okay here we go oh bam sure blood's dead yeah from one of the the lightning bolts oh. that the can. so they don't even know that it's possible yeah and it just it's so heartbreaking strikes him down and adolin is just like screaming when he oh it's, it's terrible super I think sad that's one thing i've definitely taken out of these books on the reread adolin's uh personality because in Oathbringer, we see him depicted like from childhood onward from mm-hmm. Dalinar's perspective. And he says multiple times like how warm and open and friendly and emotional Adolin is, which I always felt like was weird. I just didn't I didn't get that from the first two books the first time I read them. This time around on the reread, I'm seeing all of those little moments that 
show you that Adolin is like a really sensitive, empathetic, kind-hearted guy. I think what's great too is that Brendan didn't have to beat anyone over the head with yeah, that. Yeah, it's not in your face. Yeah. It's just really subtle in the way that he reacts to things and like the few little moments that we get from his perspective that um it's really grounded which i think is great and as we've talked about before all of his characters are so three-dimensional yeah i think there's a moment when uh they are headed out to investigate one of the fallen chasm fiend and shallan is on this journey with them so she can draw and stuff and this is right before they fall into the chasms which we'll talk about but Kaladin and Shallan are talking and Kaladin says something mean about Adolin and she's like oh yeah you're totally right Adolin the man yeah. who's hated by everyone and is totally uh, disrespectful yeah, he's just to... an awful person and then they like she points at him without even looking that's the best part she's drawing she's drawing and then without even looking she just kind of motions to her right and Kaladin looks over and Adolin is like playing or being playful just with like, the bridgeman yeah he's like uh, hanging the, out with the bridgeman like having a great time everyone's laughing they're yeah. like getting some water i think there's like a young kid like a little squire or something not a windrunner squire just a regular squire and he's like putting on adolin's oh, shard yeah, helmet yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's like 10 times too big for his head and everyone's like laughing and having a good time just this like wholesome it joyful is, just, moment exactly. of course kaladin's just like I fucking hate everything joyful. <laughs> it's like uh, weeping sadness. I don't yeah. have TN. And then they fall on a gigantic Let me just pit. move my bangs out of my eyes. <laughs> bangs Kaladin is best Kaladin. <laughs> bangs Kaladin is the only Kaladin. <laughs> Let's go into our five favorite moments. Favorite characters, favorite scenes, favorite emotions that you felt. <laughs> Anything great. Hit me with your first one. Okay. My first one is going to be a freaking badass quote from Yasna. And that's it. It's just a quote. I'm just going to read this because it's amazing. And that's all I have to say about it. Okay. From Yasna. What is a woman's place in this modern world? I rebel against this question, though so many of my peers ask it. The inherent bias in this inquiry seems invisible to so many of them. They consider themselves progressive because they are willing to challenge many of the assumptions of the past. They ignore the greater assumption that a place for women must be defined and set forth to begin with. Half of the population must somehow be reduced to the role arrived at by a single conversation. No matter how broad that role is, it will be, by nature, a reduction from the infinite variety that is womanhood. I say that there is no role for women. There is, instead, a role for each woman, and she must make it for herself. For some, it will be the role of a scholar. For others, it will be the role of wife. For others, it will be both. For yet others, it will be neither. Do not mistake me in assuming I value one woman's role above another. My point is not to stratify our society. We have done that far too well already. My point is to diversify our discourse. A woman's strength should not be in her role, whatever she chooses it to be, but in the power to choose that role. It is amazing to me that I even have to make this point, as I see it as the very foundation of our conversation. End quote. What I love about Yasna and this mindset that she presents, other than it's just, as you said, fairly badass, I also love that Yasna is challenging not just men in her society, but also women in her society, and particularly those that were in power or positions of power that then stratified and segregated and segmented all of these different roles for the people. I believe we mentioned it last episode, or it could have just been a conversation we're having offline, but the concept is mentioned in earlier in Words of Radiance, that it's so funny in a way that men have all the jobs on Rashar that are very 
work intensive and, oh my gosh like, death intensive <laughs> yeah and women hang around like painting That's and like doing all the fun stuff great moment in these books i think it's dalinar i think it's dalinar who just like mm-hmm. has this sort of itch in his brain where he's like i wonder if we got the worst side of this deal yeah like sure it seems like we're in charge but like what do we do? Yeah. We do all the work and the dying. Women do all the scholarship, painting, like fun stuff, as well as completely controlling all of our history and knowledge. And often money. And like <laughs> yeah. when you have a role of, um, I think of Sadius and his wife, they have yeah. such a great partnership that is really displaying the ways that the society has like figured out a way to work and operate but yeah like, sabariel and his uh mistress plona not wife uh but their relationship is great as well and it's just like you see how these structures in society are exactly what yasna is rebelling against it's the concept that there should be structure regardless of who that structure is benefiting or who it may appear to be benefiting and that is yeah. what I find so empowering. Like, you can read this in many different ways. I feel like many people could take this and apply it to their own life or apply it to their own situation. And why it's so cool is that you can do that for a bunch of different situations because it's yeah. really just about, like, power dynamics. And to your point, I think that we sort of see this playing out in world in Oathbringer between Yasna and Renarin mm-hmm. because like Yasna is clearly outside of the societal norm it's mentioned so many times you know she's a heretic she's unmarried she just completely sticks out of their society and Renarin is the other character that I think does that he just does not fit into these traditional you know quote unquote male roles and I think that's part of the connection between them that we see in Oathbringer and the large part of the reason it, that connection that she fails or is unable that's what I was alluding to I know but we don't have to allude to it. we can just say things <laughs> right out in the open all spoilers all the time people how about you number one favorite thing okay I think there is a huge and important moment for the dregs of this book, uh, which is Kaladin. Kaladin's story. Oh, does Kaladin. The, uh, the low He's road. got some good moments at the end here. Exactly. It was a long book to get him to the end, but his swearing of the third ideal when he is protecting uh, the king from Moash as well as graves and then flies out to the shattered plane you know with newfound power and ability and importantly every time they step up in one of their ideals they become more efficient at using stormlight yeah i was just thinking that yeah that's going to become important for the battle with zeth but I, i just think that you have this character who in many ways feels this internal battle is kind of harder to deal with than an external battle. Like Bridge 4, that sucked. And Sadius was bad. And One-Eyed Gaz was bad. And like those were external enemies that you could mm-hmm. really connect to. But and to a certain extent, they're more simple yes. because they're easily identifiable. And so Kaladin is dealing with mainly internal conflict and internal conflict that he himself can't even identify properly. Yeah. Um, and so it's difficult. It's And that's hard to write as well. Um, so hats off to Brandon for giving it a good attempt and something that I think he was successful at. But at the end, he really just knocks it out of the park. Yeah. Because you have this realization that Kaladin has that in the way that he loved and want, wanted to protect his brother Tien, Dalinar sees Elikar in a similar way and that Elikar is trying and is just unable to 
be the same type of person that Dalinar is. Do you want me to read some quotes from uh, my point on this? <laughs> yes, exactly. Hit me with some of your Elicar and Dalinar. Dovetail in yep, here. Passing it over to you. Because that was absolutely just, oh God, it just broke my heart. It broke my heart. Um, that moment when he suddenly realizes that the king is Dalinar's Tien. Oh, man, just that crushing realization. And the quote here is, quote, It hadn't been Tien's fault. Tien had tried. He'd still failed. So they'd killed him. End quote. And then after he saves Elokar, that, you know, well, he saves him for the first time. He tries to save him anyway. They're like walking slash stumbling through the palace as he's trying to save him. And Elokar is drunk and like kind of confused. And Kaladin, I think, is injured. Will you read this with me? Yes, absolutely. Cool. Quote, fleet kept running. Kaladin growled, getting back under Elokar's arm. What? He couldn't win, but he kept running. And when the storm caught him, it didn't matter that he died because he'd run for all he had. We all die in the end, you see, Kaladin said. The two of them walked down the corridor, Kaladin leaning on his spear to keep them upright. So I guess what truly matters is just how well you've run. And Elokar, you've kept running since your father was killed, even if you screw up all the storming time. End quote. This is the kind of realization or the practical application of the words uh, <laughs> in the first idea about journey before destination and fleet story, which we'll talk about as well, um, summarizes and encapsulates that idea that it matters that you keep trying. The most important step that you can take is the next one and that we all die in the end. It's about the journey. Yeah. And I think like the recognition all through these last couple quotes that the thing is to try, mm -hmm. that you have to try, as they say in The Good Place. <laughs> you have to try. And like that, that is the important thing. Not necessarily if you succeed, not if you are a hero, not if you are able to do things, you know, wonderfully, but just that you keep trying. That every time you get knocked down, you get back up and you try again. You try to be a good person. You try to do the things that you should do. You try to be a good king, even if you never get it right. And Elokar keeps trying. And we know that he keeps trying uh, all the way up until the moment of his death. And his moment with Kaladin before this, when he comes to Kaladin's barrack yeah. and is just like, tell me the secret. Like, tell me what like how you end up doing everything correctly because i try and i try and every time i try to make the right decision it ends up being the wrong decision and i love that moment because i think we've all felt that way at some point where you just feel like a fish out of water you feel like no matter what you do you're always on the wrong side of things whether that's like you know social anxiety or at work or in your family it's such a relatable and heartbreaking emotion. And it's such an important character moment and a connection to other characters besides just our Kaladin and our Shallan because yeah. everybody wants to be the hero, the Kaladin or the yeah. Shallan, and basically nobody is. People are Elokar. Like, people are Tien. Totally. Like, you don't go to war and become the superhero yeah. you die in the ditches like that's your role most of the people that i'm talking to there's going to be like one or two veterans out there who's like <laughs> i have been to war sir uh well thank you but the overwhelming majority of people like you hand them a spear and they're not going to be kaladin like they will be tn they most of us are just trying our best and our best isn't very good like it's <laughs> fine it's okay but, like, that's why, as you said, the important thing is trying. Yeah, exactly. Like, the trying has to be enough. Okay, back over to me. And I'm going to take this moment to say something that I could have said long ago, 
which is the audiobooks, which I jump back and forth uh, between reading them and listening to these stories. The audiobooks are read by Michael Kramer and Kate Redding. These two individuals, these performers, these actors, I don't know what the title they want, but... Uh, I think they're voice actors. Okay. Yeah. These two human beings are divine. They should be held up on a pedestal that nobody else can stand on because their reading of this story is so impactful, so incredible, and so emotional that it takes the words on the page and you have you can have a completely different and fulfilling experience by listening to these words be read by these two humans. And I am just in complete awe when a single actor, or in this case, two actors, can deliver a story that is from so many different perspectives. I've heard other audiobooks, um, World War Z by Max Brooks come to mind, that each character, and there are a lot in that story, just like there's a lot in here, is read by a different actor. And it's really great. It's like a, a stage play almost, just being read by professional actors. And like, that's super cool. But at the same time, like these two individuals, they do the entire books. And it's good in every moment. Like, the impactful moments are more impactful. The emotional, sad moments are far more saddening to me when I hear the voice crack of Michael Kramer as he's like portraying Sherbalid's death or something like Aww. that. It's it's just there are so many little things that they do that are purposeful and chosen and it's part of a performance that they're giving. And we talk about Brandon a lot. There are whole teams, hundreds of He's people. He's got a great team around yeah, him. that put together these works. And I just wanted to give a specific shout out this episode because it could apply in any moment to any one of the works that they read. Um, but Michael Kramer, Kate Redding, do the audiobooks. If you haven't had a chance, definitely pick them up maybe for the reread. Let's uh, quickly circle back to the story of fleet yes the companion piece to wander say <laughs> yes it is i think it's pretty cool how in each of these books so far we've gotten a little parable that each the one parable yeah it has yeah. its own little parable inside of it it's just kind of a fun little tidbit but this story is just so like poetic and sad and haunting in a way, but also poignant. And like you said, it just is such a great encapsulation or description of what those immortal words really mean, like what the heart of them is trying to say. So that is just a beautiful story. And then the way that it interweaves, as we just mentioned, with the, the other events is wonderful. There is also a very humorous uh, part here that happens when Wit shows up in the jail where Kaladin is and tries to tell the story of Fleet. And Kaladin is, of course, throwing a tantrum like a three-year-old. Would you like me to be Wit or Kaladin, the three-year-old, in this instance? You can be Kaladin. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Quote, I will leave as soon as the story is done. Fine. A man went to jail. He hated it there. The end. Ah, Wit said. So it's a story about a child, then? No, it's about Kaladin Cutoff. Me. Perhaps a story for a child, Wit said. I will tell you one, to get you in the mood. A bunny rabbit and a chick went frolicking in the grass together on a sunny day. A chick? Baby chicken? Kaladin said. And a what? Ah, forgot myself for a moment, Wit said. Sorry, let me make it more appropriate for you. A piece of wet slime and a disgusting crab thing with 17 legs slunk across the rocks together on an insufferably rainy day. Is that better? End quote. End quote. <laughs> <laughs> it is better because it just personifies everything about Rashar. Yeah, Disgusting exactly. crab thing, lots slime, of wet slime. rain, rocks. Insufferably rainy day. 
<laughs> which as a resident of the Pacific Northwest, we know quite a bit about. Insufferably rainy days, yes. <laughs> I think that the story of Fleet, as you said, does interweave so well with what our characters are learning. This includes Dalinar, who is you know, figuring out what it means to be the leader of the Knights Radiant. He yeah, eventually, and to course, like not back away from his visions. Yes, and the story of Fleet then very much applies to Dalinar's own realization kind of about the words with his what's the most important step a man could take. That's totally very yeah. much the same story as Fleet, just told from his perspective. And I think that... These stories that we've mentioned, Wandersale, Fleet, The Girl Who Looked Up, the wit parables, if you will, I think we'll see another one in Rhythm of War. I think so, too. And I believe that they are really important in a way that is not dissimilar from how the songs and poems of Lord of the Rings were actually some of the things that Tolkien spent the most time on and would maybe build entire chapters or scenes or ideas and concepts around a poem around a story like this is the story that the dwarves sing well then the dwarves need a moment that all of these lyrics come from and so then he imagines the history like around the song and i feel like that's a similar thing that these parables that are coming from wit are the heart of the story in many ways, and then so much of it gets built up around these stories. Well, and they could be stories from elsewhere in the Cosmere, too. I really want that to be the case, is that we'll find out, you know, in the future uh, that this is actually stories from elsewhere in the Cosmere's past. Cool. So, from Fleet, let's go to... One of my favorite moments, I think, because it is a moment of character growth for Kaladin, yes. But more importantly, I think this is the... We talked about kind of how Shallan is like having this amazing coming out party in book two. Yeah. And her character just like explodes in interest and she's doing everything and she's like morphing to become different characters so she can do different things. And she's like sneaking around the ghost bloods and she's brightness radiant with all of the political people. But I think that the key character moment for both of these individuals happens after the fall into the chasm where... Sean and Kaladin both live, both thinking that they save the other because they don't know that the other so is a radiant. So funny. Because when I was reading that, you get it first from Kaladin's perspective. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I survived. Oh, I must have saved Shallan. And I thought, you arrogant little guy. Like, <laughs> oh, I must have saved her because I'm Kaladin. But then and then the Shallan same... says the same yeah, thing. Exactly. She's like, I must have saved him. And I was like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> it is really the only, you know that you're a superhero. And you know that you can do stuff that you aren't fully capable of understanding. So it does make sense that both of them would have the same thought that, like, clearly I'm the important one in this situation. (laughs) I love that, of course, they both have moments of interpersonal growth. But we also get some important magic Uh, moments and i want to mention the magic moments before i mention the character moments okay so magic moments a shallan is using her quote-unquote shard blade which is how it is referred to but it does something that we never see any other shard blade do and this is an indicator that it is not a shard blade Um, But it shrinks down, she says, basically becoming a large knife instead of the full, like, six-foot-long blade. And the only thing that we know of that can do that, the shrinking and changing shapes, is a spren blade. Well, which we haven't even seen at this point. Exactly. We know nothing about spren blades. But we are learning about Shallan's backstory. We know that she has this um, kind of vision of her mother's soul being kept behind the painting in her family home and her use of the blade at that point and then later shortly later when she gives it to Kaladin um it's all it all doesn't make perfect sense for a shard blade based on what we know of shard sure. blades. yeah and so it's this moment of like 
Brandon is clearly introducing something and either you're going to recognize it and or you're going to bump on it and then immediately skip over it and just be like, oh yeah, of course it's a shard blade and you're going to keep reading. But at all of that time, Kaladin is holding another spren in the form or he's holding pattern and the relationship that Shalon has admitting that pattern is part of her and has been part of her all that time is happening in this way that it's like it's very physical where so much of what we were just talking about is all internal and it's like different internal dialogues but this is like something that is very connected to the physical realm she summons the shard blade she's you she, she summons the spren blade she's using the spren blade she's giving the spren blade and showing it off to kaladin it's like shallan's internal rumblings are starting to kind of manifest themselves in the physical world and take on more physical shape because before she'd been keeping so much of the secret and now it's starting to leak out into the real well, world. Well, I mean, she is not really forthcoming about her shard blade. She doesn't even necessarily like want to yeah. summon it. She just has to. Simply the idea that she would summon it and like thinks about it in those as something that she can summon i think is an important step for her and kind of an important moment where yeah. she is demonstrating that she's showing growth before necessarily we think that she's showing that growth mm. and i think that's cool because clearly the most impactful other than running away and killing a chasm fiend uh but <laughs> the most impactful <laughs> moment in the chasms comes in this dialogue between Shallan and Kaladin where they are talking about their experience of pain and Kaladin being Kaladin thinks that everything revolves around his pain and his experiences. Yeah. This is it's really the the crux or the climax of the issues that Kaladin is having in this book. Mm -hmm. This is the thing his relationship and interaction with Shalon is the thing that allows him to see outside of himself and his own pain, like you said, and to see that things can be different. He can see things from a different perspective. There are many quotes that we could pull out from this scene. There's short ones like, sorrow is not your companion, and that you don't need to just hang out with that all the time, Kaladin. <laughs> Well, no, that's what he says to Shalon when he's like, you have no idea what it's like to be, you know, sad or to have a difficult life. Oh, I he understand. Yeah, her. he's using that as like a, a weapon. Like, sorrow yeah. is my companion. I'm yeah. saying, bro, you don't need to. Oh, hook yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, like, you don't need to be friends with that person. Yeah, dude. exactly. Like, the best, you can kick companion. him to the curb. <laughs> <laughs> Stick with Syl. This is not a Guardians of the Galaxy situation <laughs> where you just like keep collecting weird oddballs and just be like, yeah, this is my buddy Sorrow. That's not, <laughs> it's not a Groot situation. You can just pass that one along. <laughs> just let him go. I think that really what gets at the key though is this concept that Kaladin has experienced and kind of woven himself this narrative of being someone who is companions with sorrow and lives with sorrow totally and he he identifies by all of his hardships yes 100 percent and he feels broken. He identifies as a broken person. And then he sees in Shallan someone who is also broken. But then he goes on to describe her this way. Quote, why wasn't this woman broken? Truly broken. She described herself that way. But she was no more broken than a spear with a chipped blade. And a spear like that could still be as sharp a weapon as any. He preferred one with a score or two on the blade, a worn handle. A spearhead that had known fighting was just better than a new one. You could know it had been used by a man fighting for his life and that it had remained sure and not broken. Marks like those were signs of strength. End quote. Yeah, and I think the like thing that comes out of this exchange that's so great is the recognition of like many different types of strength mm -hmm. and Kaladin has a certain type of strength you know he has sort of a hard-headed stubborn resilience that has gotten him through 
everything that has yeah. you know helped him a save Kelsier other slaves and strength. yeah yeah absolutely and here we see that there is another path you can be like Shalon and like that is a different kind of strength and he compares it to Tien mm -hmm. and kind of says like wow could I be strong enough to be that person who is lifting up everyone else around them like could I be that person who is providing the light when there is none you know, like that, that's a different kind of strength, a different kind of responsibility to take on that he sort of recognizes in that moment that he doesn't have that type of strength and he respects it in Shalon. And it's definitely something that he is going to, I think, fail at and see that as his failure point when it comes to Oathbringer and his failure to swear the fourth ideal. Um, in that moment, I think it is connected to the same issue that he's dealing with here in these chasms is that he does not see himself as the person who can lift up others but that very much is the role of the wind runners um kind of i think most clearly exemplified by the squires i actually wonder yeah if the uh the squires will ever have problems if kaladin were to clearly the squires kind of came after kaladin had well advanced a little bit i think they do lose their powers if, if kaladin is like even far away from them so yeah. i would guess that if he you know like if sil were to leave him again in the future obviously the squire's powers would go away too i would certainly think so and i just I feel like that connection is important and for Kaladin, it's a great moment of growth that is interwoven with the same moments of growth I was talking earlier about Shallan. And so that's what I really love about that scene in the chasms. And then they come back and they're like conquering heroes and everyone's like super excited and it's really I love cool. that they get this moment of like friendship though. This is the first time that we really see two Knights Radiants interacting together yeah. it took a long time it takes a really long time to get them to like, like actually interact in a meaningful way so, yeah yeah um and i i just really hope that we see their friendship develop because i think they have a lot to offer each other in a non-romantic way you know i think that they as we've been saying are sort of two sides of a coin um and that together they can really like bolster each other and help each other and be really awesome friends so i hope we see that yeah i definitely think that that would be a great path for them to go down as kind of confidants and friends that grow with each other yeah i am not opposed to the thruple i'm just gonna keep putting I'm that out i'm still there. okay yeah. with the triad but and the name's still in work <laughs> Tell me about another one of your favorite moments or scenes. Okay. Well, one of the interludes really stuck out to me as super important this reread, which is Lon's interlude. It is the one with the Ardent uh, starting a new job, so to speak, yeah. at the capital city of Kolinar. And I remember the first couple of times I read this book, I just didn't really understand that interlude and then like it was kind of boring and so i just kind of read through it quickly and then didn't really get it and this time i was like oh my gosh this is actually so important and is like really helpful to understanding things that happen later on down the line like everything that is said later in this book about colinar having a uh riot a riot happening yeah and then obviously literally everything that happens in oathbringer starts here in this interlude this is the catalyst moment because Lon is a new ardent who seems excuse me Lon is the older ardent who is drunk and seems to be in a position of like extreme laziness yeah. combined with like gluttony and yep. like all the worst of the seven deadly sins the palace is just a place of excess mm -hmm. and the ardents are allowed to have and do whatever they want as long as they keep telling everyone that the queen is a wonderful pious perfect person of course the new ardent is devout and a believer and clearly thinks that the queen is doing things that are wrong which she is and is going to represent this challenge 
to Lon and the other Ardents. And just like we were talking earlier with the Asna, these challenges to powers and the structures, uh, this is this is good stuff. This is it's this is so the fun stuff. Like, good. You, this is exactly what revolutions are built around. Exactly. Yeah. It's just like the perfect snapshot of the way a revolution happens. This one person decides to stand up and is like, let me tell you everything that I was wrong with the queen. She gets beheaded the next day and everyone loses their shit. I think that there is one caveat that I at least want to mention now because it's going to be important, as you said, in Oathbringer, is that Kolinar is already under the effect of two different unmade. Oh, yeah. That's definitely playing in here. Yeah. And so, like, the Ardents who are being bad are not doing so completely on their own. Of their own will. Yes. And the queen, who is acting terribly, is also possessed by one of the unmade. Yeah. So the young Arden who loses her life, unfortunately does it because she is, like, recognizing these an aspect of these kind of eternal beings in the form of the unmade and everyone else is like trying to stop her. I kind of wish if it was a, you know, slightly more realistic novel that we were reading, um, that this was just like a story more about corruption in the same way that Moash, um, dealt with the King and like how that issue, I remember when Dalinar tells Kaladin about like he, Kaladin confronts, Dalinar and he says like he's a bad king he lets people go who are responsible for murder and he's like you heard about that and Kaladin's like taken aback at first he's like how do you know like Moash told me because it was his grandparents what happened to that Dalinar says like we saw that the person responsible was punished like don't worry I took care of it and he's like how did you punish him how did you punish what Kaladin knows to be Rashon, and Dalinar says, we sent him to some place that he can't hurt anyone or couldn't hurt anyone. And just the break, like I would have snapped hardcore. Oh my gosh. I would have just been like, can't hurt anyone. It's like, that's to me, that is that story that Moash and Kaladin are all interwoven in around Elikar and Dalinar and the people that surround a king. Like, all of that stuff to me is interesting enough. I wouldn't even need the magic. Like I could totally see a similar type of story without the unmade, that just like the unmade didn't exist at all. And it was a revolution that was started completely by, you know, improper management of your population. Yeah, but those books exist. <laughs> they do exist. And I'm I all I'm trying to say We come here for the magic. Yeah, exactly. The unmade <laughs> are there, and I don't want to lose out on the unmade, but I also I think this is a fair criticism of Brandon's books. Here it is. Get ready for the criticism, people. I think that the way that Brandon is focused and the story that Brandon is telling is not as connected to the reality of how people and humans operate in a way that, for example... Like George R. R. Martin is far more concerned with his like famous line is, yeah, at the end of Lord of the Rings, everyone bows down and the age of men begins and it's all fantastic. But nobody ever asks about Aragorn's tax policy because Aragorn's tax policy is not what Tolkien wanted to write about. It's not a super interesting thing, but tax policy and how riots are dealt with in major cities those things are really significant and important and like if a general was betrayed on a battlefield in the way that dalinar was betrayed there's a good chance that a lot of those men would just leave that army and like that didn't happen so you just want more reality in your fantasy not necessarily that that's not that's not what i'm saying no i'm saying this is like one of the criticisms that i believe makes a lot of sense okay on that note let's jump back over to another one of my favorite things which is the epigraphs because it's very similar to lon's interlude in the way that 
these epigraphs contain so much and so many hints about mm. what is going to happen in Oathbringer. Yes. And it happened so much and it was so noticeable that the epigraphs at the end of Words of Radiance were setting up Oathbringer that now on our Oathbringer reread, I'm going to really focus in on the epigraphs in you know parts oh, four and five. Totally. Because I think that those are going to be setting up Rhythm of War in the same way. There's a bunch of hints, including about the unmade. I mean, you have multiple unmade name checked, dro- their name drops in the epigraphs for the very first time. We get way more information on basically all of those. Nergul, Moalak, the sister, or the, like, all of these things are dropped, mentioned in the epigraphs, and then expanded upon in Oathbringer. For example, we have chapter 83 and 84 here. Would you read the first one? Yes, from chapter 83. Obviously, they are fools. The desolation needs no usher. It can and will sit where it wishes, and the signs are obvious that the spren anticipate it doing so soon. The Ancient of Stones must finally begin to crack. It is a wonder that upon his will rested the prosperity and peace of a world for over four millennia. Now, the Ancient of Stones... What is that? Oh, that's the Herald. Oh, that's Telenolot. You think it's Telenolot? Yeah, because it says mm. the Ancient of Stone must finally begin to crack. It is sure, a wonder yeah, that yeah. upon his will rested the prosperity and peace of a world for over four millennia. I see it. So the Ancient of the Stone Wards, the leader nice. of the Stone Wards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course, we know that Telenolot is cracking yeah. and is about to oh he cracked yeah he, he cracked he's fully cracked <laughs> he cracked um, like a nut and well, i mean it took four thousand years but <laughs> he eventually did crack and that all of the relative peace and prosperity that we have seen on rashar is his doing and given on his suffering basically yep chapter 84 quote hold the secret that broke the night's radiant You may need it to destroy the new orders when they return. End quote. Now, this is actually just a series of numbers when it's prevented in the, when it's presented in the epigraphs. Uh, It's just like one, one, two, five, six, blah, 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 blah. And Cosmere fans on the 17th Shard and the Coppermind have. They've decrypted it. Yes. Cracked this and one other oh my gosh. of the numbers only epigraphs. So cool. Way to go, cool fans. Yeah, Cosmere nerds are the best nerds. Cryptography. What I think is great here is, of course, this secret of the Knights Radiant that broke them. Yeah. And could be used to break them in the future. I need to know. Is exactly what. Teravandrian tries to wield and use like a a hammer against the newly forming Knights Radiant. I find it interesting only in the regards of just like, do do people really care that like this war that's been going on back and forth between the listeners and the humans was technically started by the humans? Like, is that important? To these people at this point? Yeah. It seems like, yes, it's portrayed as if it's very important, but I would have a lot of trouble being like explaining to the normal soldier in like Dalinar's army. Sure. Just be like, hey man, we can't fight anymore. And the Radiants all lost their powers. It's actually our fault. Because like humans are from a different planet and we took over Rashar. Like, I'd just be like, dude, they killed Tom. Like yeah. last week, like Tom is dead now, and like I held his guts in while he died. Like, right? I don't. No, I think care. that's a great point. That the sort of the philosophical underpinnings of like how the war started at some point are just negligible after so many years of fighting. Like you just build up, you know, grudges on grudges, and you're like, yeah, I'm not fighting these people for some ideal that we were once fighting them about now i'm just fighting them because yesterday they killed my friend exactly what you were saying yeah and so i it's a big part of oathbringer and it's uh, you know a big revelation and it goes around the world and everybody's like having fights and angry about it and for most of that book on my first and second read throughs i was just like i see how this would be damaging especially to people in power but like i do not see how the whatever 30 to 50,000 troops 
that make up the human army would really be impacted by this. Well, and I think we're going to keep seeing that play out as we go forward. But I think there's sort of a line between people who really do care, the people who are like trying to be good people, you know, who are like, hey, ooh, our bad, like maybe we need to start creating a peace or like being nicer to these Parshendi and be like, sorry, guys, you know, let's find a way to coexist. And then the other part of the population that is like, I still want my Parshman servants. You can't just take them away from me. Yeah, that, those people are super crazy because that's like an aspect that both ends Words of Radiance and begins Oathbringer is you have all of this kind of societal disruption simply based on the and fact economic. that they don't have yeah, slaves anymore. That's what I mean. Just like their economy and their society is broken because their slaves just get up and walk away. Yeah. And they were like, well, we've never needed to chain or beat or like capture the slaves. It's just... What a strange world. Well, and then Kaladin in this book also mentions like, okay, so if we don't have Parshmen, Dark Eyes are going to have to do the work, but you have to pay Dark Eyes more Mm -hmm. because they have a specific cast in their system. You have to pay them for their, I think it's Dawn for Dark Mm -hmm. Eyes. And so like you're saying, it just throws everything into chaos where you're like, okay, well, we can't really afford to pay them or we can't afford to pay that many or like do we start just making more people slaves which they obviously did because kaladin was a slave and many other humans are slaves right but like the part they would have to like really up those numbers (laughs) yeah absolutely and that comes with a lot of difficulty not only that we've seen in our own history here on earth but just the simple fact that you had a bunch of slaves that were bridgemen uh, who kind of were working all the time to break out of those bonds and eventually did by manifesting superpowers. However, I think that that's like just a key aspect is just like holding a bunch of slaves is hard. Um, and the having a slave economy generally doesn't work out for the places that have an economy, like maybe for a little bit. You, right. can, you can be a Rome and grow really fast and have a bunch, but eventually 85,000 <laughs> slaves are all going to be led by Spartacus to just come and kill a bunch of people. It's just, that's generally how those societies work or societies that operate in that way work. Well, speaking of death, excellent. <laughs> let's go back to Zeth's death. Huh, that's fun to say. Zeth's death. Zeth's death. <laughs> <laughs> he dies falling through the storm. And then, as you mentioned at the top of the episode, he is resurrected by Nalan using some kind of life restoring fabriel that I'm assuming is from, you know, the ancient times that Nalan has just like held on to because it definitely doesn't exist with the current fabrials. Yeah, it would be the ancient Fabrials that our Fabrials are trying to copy. Right, exactly. So that's an interesting tidbit. And then I think Nalan's words about how and why he resurrects Zeth are super interesting. And like, there is something here. He says, quote, I waited until you crashed to the ground, until you were broken and mangled, your soul cut through, dead for certain. Then I restored you. You died. Your bond to your blade severed. All ties, both spiritual and physical, undone. End quote. So to me, this sounds like very key, very similar to Cognitive Shadow, Kelsier, Mistborn Secret History Realm. Yeah. Because like, remember when Kelsier dies, you have this very sequence, this very clear sequence of events that Fuzz Preservation says happens to everyone. And it is, you are severed from your physical body and your cognitive self goes to meet Fuzz. And Fuzz says hello to everyone. You're going to then pass on. And you go from like the physical realm letting go which we assume happened when Zeth fell to his death. And like that was, he's exiting the physical realm. He let go. He let go hardcore. And then he would enter the cognitive realm 
not meet a fuzz character but instead nalan is there i think to basically perform some type of kelsier mistborn era 2 like hemallergy when he takes the cognitive shadow and like staples it into a body yeah i think that's definitely what happened i just think it's interesting like the sort of middle ground that nalan has to strike in order for this to work he has to wait for zeth to like definitely be dead but he can't do it so late that zeth's brain dies like he says that in particular he's like it can't be too long i can't wait until your brain dies but you definitely have to be dead so there's like this quick you know moment in there somewhere that is the perfect time where i could restore you and have you be this weird cognitive shadow in a body type thing now i haven't really seen it that way yet this is the first time I'm like considering that as Zeth and Kelsier being identical. They may not be identical, but just hypothetically stay with me for a second. I wonder if we will see problems develop. I feel like comic books or some stories have dealt with this when you like try to bring back a ghost. Mm. Well, we know that Zeth does have sort of a ghost quality now. He leaves a... a imprint sort of in the air when he moves yeah that's when I, i'm thinking there's like we should look to zeth to see what might be an issue for kelsier mm. uh down the road interesting and vice versa if we happen to be able to pull out something about kelsier and mistborn air too we should maybe wonder if that is also going to impact zeth in some way because this fabrial resurrection bit I think is interesting and if you can do why are we not like mass producing this fabrial because only the nalan has it i know but i'm just saying like if it's a fabrial then we can figure mm. out how to work it mm -hmm. and you know give it to navani and she can break that down recreate it um but i i just think that the there's got to be some consequences. Yeah, I don't think that the uh, it's all positive for Zen. Yeah, and it might actually. I would imagine that this Fabriel is sort of the mechanical version of like an edge dancer. Mm. But an edge dancer, I would assume this is what I'm guessing. Edge dancer, if they revive someone, there are no bad consequences. But if you use the Fabriel, because it's like that sort of manufactured like yeah, version of the power, there's like going to be some iffy stuff. Yeah, I think it kind of like a in neutral power or in positive power versus an in negative. Fabrials definitely seem to be the in negative version of uh, we'll see. powers on Rashar. We will definitely see. Cosmere connections. There are a bunch and they all happen everywhere it's beautiful there's we, a lot we've yeah. talked about nightblood obviously we know zahel was there previously he plays less of a role in the second half of the book but we also know that azure is going to be coming in oathbringer there are a couple just sort of small things that jumped out to me that i made connections to other worlds and other magic systems here for example, Lyft says that she trapped Windle with words, which reminded me of like uh, commands on Nalthus and mm. sort of the word powered magic. That's interesting. The concept of it being attached to a command is very Lyft like. Like, I see, like he, she makes Windle do things that Windle otherwise couldn't do. And I wonder how much of that is like, yeah, a command. And that is kind of how it works, right? Like they say the words and then the spren is bonded, bonded to them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Bondage, as previously mentioned, not always a great thing. Yeah. Like not, yeah, a, yeah. not voluntary <laughs> in all moments. And then Eshenai mentions when she takes war form, she says that the new form feels like she can like feel a power sort of trapped like a river that's dammed and waiting to be freed. Um, that she can now use in war form, which sounds a lot like the door in Elantris. That sort of concept of the power Powers being behind. trapped yeah, and then you can channel it. Yeah, exactly. 
And then also when the humans uncover their first war form Parshendi and they're like inspecting the corpse, the way that Shalon describes it sounds very similar to the Dakor in Elantris where they have these like ridges underneath their skin. Is it called storm form at this point or is it war form? Oh, I'm sorry. Storm form. So, I yeah, meant this storm is the one form. with red. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And my bad. No, it's all good. Uh, I just wanted to clarify. That, Thank like, you. The I think the Parshendi forms anyways are similar to the decor. So war form creating the carapace in a more, um, we'll call it like bulky armor way. And then the storm form, the way that the ridges and kind of spikes um form underneath the skin and enhance the bones like i feel like that definitely has a very similar vibe yeah. to the decor monks and we've talked about this before but i definitely want like more of a lantris so that i could get more of the magic so i can understand yeah. other magic more. <laughs> and i think this would be a spot where it would really help is like the parshendi the decor those two are connected and gaining more knowledge about one might give you more knowledge about the other how about hoid sightings who our man hoid was a little bit of everywhere in the second half um obviously we know that stormlight archive is when hoid is most apparent so we've already mentioned he goes to prison tells kaladin the story of fleet but he is also present at a dinner uh where it's the one right as Dalinar's visions are being secretly distributed and he's like they're trying to make fun everyone's of him. making fun of him yeah and he realizes that at the dinner but hoyd gives one of his most important lines i think in understanding the greater hoyd purpose other than like specific stories but this one line yeah is real good he says quote i am but a man dalinar so much as i wish it were not true at times i am no radiant And while I am your friend, please understand that our goals do not completely align. You must not trust yourself with me. If I have to watch this world crumble and burn to get what I need, I will do so. With tears, yes, but I would let it happen. End quote. Iconic Hoyd moment. It really is. Like, you've elevated yourself now to a completely new level Hoyd where there... We think we have an understanding of things. We think- And like, I would say in general, we see Hoyd up until this point as an ally, as a friend, yes. as someone who's on our side, who wants all the same things that we do. And so it's really shocking in this moment to hear him say so clearly to the contrary. It solidifies the idea that the first interpretation or your first reading of a character is probably not the best or most accurate yeah. <laughs> one. Uh, because once you start to unravel this like Hoyd character, it seems so fun and interesting. And you're like, where is he in this book? Where is he in this book? And maybe you look it up online, just be like, show me all the Hoyd sightings. And then this line comes along and you're just like, oh, I might have made a mistake. Maybe the guy with near superhuman you know, age and seemingly immortality and a whole bunch of powers is not the person that I think is like a friendly kind it's of It's good to guy. remember that there's a lot we don't know about Hoyd. And like he says, maybe we shouldn't completely trust him. <laughs> he also shows up in the epilogue where Yasna pops out of the uh, cognitive realm, which is super great she mentions uh the storm you know i love how she comes out of the cognitive realm and she's like i need to warn everyone i need to save them and what's like yeah you're too late (laughs) and he sort of tells her what's happening she is like wait a second that's not how it happened in the past that's not what the spren told me basically all of the information that she spent the entire book gathering is now invalid and Wit confirms that. He says, you are correct. It is different this time, which I think is fascinating. Like so much in this book and this story we base on what happens in history and like the same thing happening over and over again. And so it's cool to hear like, okay, this is actually a whole different thing that's happening now. And finally, the letters that were divided among the epigraphs, one of them from Hoyd, one of them to Hoyd, 
there are a bunch of stuff that we could pull out from that, but I believe that most importantly is this quote that is directed at Hoyd. So Hoyd is the reader, and we believe that maybe Frost is the author of this letter. Quote, You, however, have never been a force for equilibrium. You tow chaos behind you like a corpse dragged by one leg through the snow. Please, hearken to my plea. Leave that place and join me in my oath of non-intervention. End quote. Another great example that, like, maybe Hoyt isn't as good as we thought. I love that mention of him not being a force for equilibrium and kind of leaving just chaos behind him. You're kind of like, oh, maybe we don't want Hoyt here. And we have talked a lot about Hoyt and his greater purpose and greater meanings. We've read Traveler, uh, mm-hmm. which is a Hoyt-based story I think we have Frost. two episodes about Hoyt and the letters, so yeah. if you want a refresher, you can listen to those. It would also be great if you could rate, review us. This is our summertime plea, our summertime ask. It definitely helps new people find the Cosmere literally every time there is a new rating or review, I can just watch the numbers go up. And that's just more people who are wanting to be a part of the greater Cosmere and the greater Cosmere community. And they're just finding their little way to us one step at a time. Especially these days when we can't meet friends in person. Like, come here, have a little digital community. (laughs) We are hopefully going to be getting our Stormlight Call to Adventure game soon. And if you are interested in hearing a review of the game, let us know. That could potentially be a podcast episode. If you want to hear what we think about it, et cetera, again, let us know. Twitter, email, Facebook, Reddit. And after that, we're just doing Oathbringer. As Sabariel says, onward to glory or some such nonsense. <laughs> Get on your Oathbringer rereads. We'll be checking back in with our first episode. Again, it'll be divided into two parts and we will... Might be more than two parts. Yeah, I mean, we can do whatever we want. It's our podcast. Until next time, life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination.